Hey everyone, welcome. <clears throat> Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Friday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers have more players than can play in an NBA game typically. So who is going to sit? Who gets squeezed? That's next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcast. It's always free. It's never going to be behind a paywall. And Locked On Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to hang out with over 20,000 subscribers to the channel. Um, getting real, real excited, Andy, for the start of the season. Now the Lakers roster is locked in. Uh, we're going to talk about where they kind of stack up now in the West now that they do have uh, a set roster uh, that that slot has been filled with a potentially impactful player in Christian Wood. Uh, do you want to let people know that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On? Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet five dollars and get two hundred in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com/slash Locked On to get started. Five dollars to get. 200 that's like an austin reeves contract type value uh right there so you know take advantage of that um to me andy the thing about bismack biombo for example as a potential option the lakers could have signed like he would have played he would have been important he would have had a role on the team but i'm not a hundred percent sure his impact on the rotation on a game-to-game -game basis would have been Super. Pro. There would have been days that you didn't see him, where they didn't use Biombo, where they didn't need him. This way, I, th I, I think um, I wouldn't have objected to the signing. I think it would have been a good one. But Wood to me is a different deal because you bring him in, he's going to play, and he's going to play. Assuming things don't go off the rails, he's going to play every game, and he's going to play real minutes. He's too good not to. Right. 18 to 25 or something, you know, 17 to 25 minutes depending on the matchup and obviously more on those days where AD doesn't play. His impact, it is hard to think of a guy they could have signed who would impact the rotation more than would. And they have more players now um, that are legitimate NBA rotation players then can play in a typical NBA game, assuming everybody's healthy. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be Darvin Ham, I think his first test as a coach. Like I, I don't know how much he ever played, you know, inner intermediary, you know, that sort of thing, uh, on rosters in Milwaukee or Atlanta where he was an assistant. And, you know, some sometimes assistant and assistants end up buffers that way and confidants for different players, you know, when you, you don't feel like going to the head coach about something or, you know, you don't necessarily have a great relationship with the head coach. You know, you often end up talking with the assistants about this stuff. They smooth things over. But this is going to be his first test as the head guy, if nothing else, of somebody's not going to play. They're not going to like it. It is a good problem to have globally. It is a tough problem to have on a micro level. And you're going to have to explain this in ways that may not keep everybody happy, mm -hmm. but you need to keep everybody on the same page and not griping. It will help if they're winning. Oh, if, they're win yeah. if they're winning, nobody has a right to say a damn thing, but every season has adversity of some kind. And when that adversity takes place, that's often when the chirping also can follow. And Darwin's going to have to negotiate you know, the wants and needs and, you know, all that stuff of a lot of guys who will rightly feel like I am an NBA rotation player. I should be playing. And I, I we don't even need to, we are way too far away to get into the, you know, what does Wood mean for the playoffs? And it's like the playoff rotation, all this kind of stuff. Like, yes, could Christian Wood be a, a difficult, a more challenging guy to get fine minutes for in the playoffs? Yes, you know, so is Jared Vanderbilt, so is D'Angelo Russell sometimes. So it's like that is months away. I'm just talking about the regular season. I know you are too. Like the the most regular season games, coaches will go nine to ten deep. Um, 
if you know if you have that that kind of guy available nine is a is a normal number sometimes i'll go to 10 it's hard to play more than 10 guys in a game any kind of meaningful minutes and so you look at what the lakers have in terms of guys who are going to play or could say like you you do andy uh, i deserve to play d'angelo vanderbilt vincent ad um Christy, LeBron. I think they count on him. I'm just going through the. I'm literally rolling down the roster. Prince, Reeves, um, LeBron, Rui, uh, Christian Wood, and you know you're you're at ten already. Um, that you're already talking about like one of those guys may not may not play. And when you start to think, you know, break down how the Lakers can sort out a really crowded. Remember when the Lakers didn't have enough bigs? Mm-hmm. Remember that? Remember or that? enough wings? Or enough wings? You know, not a problem anymore. When, I mean, when I, who do you? How, what is your initial read of who gets squeezed? Whether that's they play bigger and squeeze people further, like the the guards, maybe in some way, shape, or form, or do you think it's more? Vanderbilt, Rui's minutes. What? 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 How? What was your initial read? Well, I mean, the the first thing that popped to mind, and this is the most utopian version of an outcome and a solution to this, is you find ways to use this depth to where you can reduce LeBron and AD's minutes. Sure, and you know, try to come up with a rotation that is in part with the goal of getting those guys three to four minutes fewer each game if possible. I mean, not counting games where hopefully you you blow teams out or control a game enough that the last five to six minutes, three to four minutes are totally in hand. Those guys can sit anyway. But I'm just talking about their regular rotation minutes. You try to use this type of depth, you know, whether you're talking about the scoring that you just added with Christian Wood or the guys in Reeves or D'Lo or Rui who can all create their own shots for themselves beyond what they can do for everyone else. Like try to find ways to reduce the minutes, which will in turn offer a few more minutes to divvy up for everybody else. Maybe keep everybody happy while that larger goal of keeping LeBron and AD fresh beyond that, you know, I, we're going to discuss him later on more specifically um, in terms of that extension that he is eligible for, beginning yesterday, but Jared Vanderbilt was the first guy that popped to mind for me because, you know, I talked before about wanting to see Vanderbilt in like a 15 minute a night, 18 minute a night starting role, Uh because I, I think there's a lot of defensive optionality that comes from playing him in the first five. And also I think particularly now that Christian Woods here, the areas to play him in the second unit, assuming the other guys you have penciled into play actually do. And, you know, LeBron, AD, those guys are going to play at times with sure. bench guys. I start feeling like if you don't start Jared Vanderbilt, there's a very good chance he may not have a place to play in this rotation. So he was the first guy that actually popped to mind for me. Yeah. Either like he starts or he may not play. And... You know, I think because we're still going, we're going to see the Lakers go big. Like, I mean, they, they've got too much size now, and too much like mobile size to not leverage that. Dude, they're you know? a big team now. <laughs> you know, they are big in those moments where Wood and AD play together with LeBron or whatever. You know, that you just you just whether all these guys are together or not, just the starting the presumed starting lineup. Let's just put Rui in it just for fun or not put Vanderbilt in it. Who's certainly got a little bit of length to him and a little bit of bounce. Um, you know, D'Angelo Russell is a very big guard. Um, and you know, you're starting him next to Reeves, who is not little, you know, he's not, you know, undersized by any stretch. And you have LeBron James, who is a bulky human being to say the least and anthony davis and Rui is enormous i mean like there's particularly a lot if he's your three right there's a lot of that uh, on this roster in terms of just long and large humans and you know that is something to look forward to it's something you know max christie's got a lot of length if not the bulk yet but length um put on 10 to 15 pounds it's 
and not the way I do it. <laughs> no, I mean Christy. All joking yeah. aside, Christy looked stronger and thicker. Absolutely, absolutely. But he's still not. You know, he's still twenty years old. I mean, so um, you know, you wouldn't expect him to be fully grown in that way. No, he told Dave McMenamin he grew an inch from last year, from the beginning of last year to the end of last season. Know, that's how you know you're young when you're still growing. Um, I'm shrinking. <laughs> I'm, I'm that old. Mm -hmm. But let's 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 talk about Vanderbilt because. I think you're right. I think there's a very good chance that at least initially he could be the guy. He's going to play because, you know, Davis is going to play every game and guys are going to get hurt and all that. But in terms of a bankable 16 minutes a night, you're right. It may not be there. And that really impacts this whole question about the future of Jared Vanderbilt in L.A. And we'll do that next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by FanDuel and the NFL season. It is officially underway and FanDuel has incredible offers because they are America's number one sports book. And right now, new customers can get five. They can just bet five bucks. Just bet five dollars. You get 200 back in bonus bets guaranteed. You can use those bonus bets on spreads, on player props, over-unders, Super Bowl projections, futures, all that stuff. And all customers who bet, again, just $5, you get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. And now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is really easy to use, user-friendly, fun experience, all these different betting options at your fingertips. So again, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Kick off the NFL season with an offer you don't want to miss. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. Tell me if you tell me if I'm thinking this through properly. The Lakers can make a decision about Jared Vanderbilt going forward in terms of a contract extension. We just talked about how Jared Vanderbilt could be the player who gets squeezed, at least initially, by the signing of Wood to where there's really nowhere kind of for him to fit in easily, especially if you're not going to start him. Um, and you know, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but if you do start him now, you really have a crowd of guys that you have to figure out how to play. Torian Prince needs to sort of back up LeBron. Like you, I don't see them sitting him. Um, and, and it just, I mean, it becomes if nothing else. They invested the biannual. They want to right. see what they have in him, and, and he brings shooting that they he need. He brings shooting and he's, he is a, a roster slot in terms of that you know, genuine small forwards, you know, small forward, power forward, like, you know, and doesn't have some of the same defense or offensive limitations as Vanderbilt kind of does, you know, Vanderbilt and Wood actually could play together. That's not the issue. It's more of a minutes thing. And a, but anyway, so you have a situation where the Lakers might not have a space to play Vanderbilt this year in a consistent way. We've seen that he can be difficult to play in the playoffs, even when Wood isn't here. Um, you have Wood, who if he plays... So you have to make a decision about maybe extending Vanderbilt in a season where you may not play him that much. Um, but the flip side is, that really doesn't necessarily get impacted by Christian Wood beyond this year, because in theory, if Wood plays really well, correct me if I'm wrong, we're back in one of these situations where the Lakers will have a harder time bringing him back if he wants to make a lot of money or somebody wants to throw more money at him, because the Lakers will be limited in what they can afford to pay him. If this goes beautifully for the Lakers, Wood could certainly be somewhere else next year. Yeah. So if I'm thinking this through correctly, the Lakers have to make a decision about a guy potentially to give a contract extension to um, who may not play, but would then be theoretically available to play again next year <laughs> when the extension would kick in. Um, and part of what I think is, is so fascinating about this is that it really, to me speaks to the, the challenge of Vanderbilt and, and figuring out what is the right amount of resources to devote to somebody like him because he's got so many potential perks and he has very obvious drawbacks. And the amount of money that you pay that guy is really important. Like that you don't go five or six million dollars over the value that you really can get from him. Um, and assessing that is hard in part because he was, would you agree of all the players they acquired 
then maybe Rui Vanderbilt was the most popular. Like, I mean, the Lakers fans loved the guy for obvious reasons. Well, they they did for a while until some of the some of the limitations began to show during the playoffs. Although I I maintain then and I maintain now, I think some of what made Vanderbilt unplayable was less about him and more about the other guys not making the outside shots or just mid-range jumpers that they are expected to make as opposed to Vanderbilt not making the corner threes that he's not really not, expected not supposed to, to make. Right. Shouldn't even like, I, I would argue that in his own right, Vanderbilt did his job as uh, laid out better than those other guys did their jobs as laid out, but those guys needed to be on the floor. Vanderbilt mm-hmm. therefore became unplayable. Um, but – what I think is interesting about this, before the Lakers acquired Christian Wood, and we, you know, we were aware that this Vanderbilt extension, uh, you know, <laughs> beginning was coming up. You become in this time of year when you're doing a daily podcast, you become very aware of all of these sorts of days. Oh yeah, the, the calendar is your friend. Yes. Um, I was thinking about it like, okay, he's making four and a half mil this season, right? If say there was an offer like either three for 27 or four for 36, basically doubling Vanderbilt's salary, but keeping it still within a uh, single million digits. Right. I forgot how many. <laughs> That's seven. You're, you're seven. in that seven to $8 million range. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, keeping it under 10 mil, something like that, around nine mil a year, doubling his salary. If, say, Vanderbilt would go for that, would you if you were the Lakers? Because to me, in theory, that seemed like a no-brainer because Vanderbilt can be really useful. It's not an excessive contract, and it could become tradable. And it becomes something that you can use to package for somebody else. You're always looking for those tradable contracts. And I don't think you know, 9 mil a year for Jared Vanderbilt even if he didn't play much for the Lakers this year, would be considered that awful of a contract because I think he's established himself enough around the league that people know he has utility. Right, and I think but what he is, he's both individually interesting to me but also representatively interesting because role guys, we saw this with Hachimura when he came, you know, like you take a role guy and put him in contextually with the right guy next to LeBron James. With this guy... All of a sudden, you know, the same player who was problematic in one spot can really thrive in another. Vanderbilt, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people have really kind of dug into the different ways that Vanderbilt can be used and ought to be used. And 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 what what is the what are the circumstances and the strategies that allow you to get the most out of somebody like him? And when you can do that, he's really valuable. When you can't, it's really hard to use him. And so year to year, the, 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 as the supporting cast changes, you know, we kind of had this conversation about Trey Young as a star. Like, you know, is it worth revamping your entire roster to do the things to, to protect Trey Young? It is not. When you get further down the roster with role guys who are – who you have to use specifically and around other specific players so that the rest of the supporting cast can suddenly change your, the utility of somebody like Vanderbilt. I mean, I think I would sign him in perpetuity for $7 million because in three or four years, 7 million is going to look like four or five. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's below a full mid-level. It's right. above a taxpayer mid-level. But beyond that, like I wouldn't do... 12 or 13 for him no i wouldn't, I wouldn't either more than that i mean as much as i love watching the guy and i love the effort i think that's that's too much you just you have to be really careful with what you're giving guys like him you know in the same way you got to be careful about what you're paying the, the guys at the very top of it you know an extra three or four million for vanderbilt takes him from being a contract that's very easily tradable and sought after just one that maybe you got to throw in sweetener um it's just but I think I just, nine I just million. the concept of like yeah. how you treat a guy like that who is a wonderful player to have on your team, but flawed and finding that sweet spot. I would love it if they could come up and everybody had said, you know what? 
you know, four and 28, let's do it. I mean, he's set for life and, you know, it's good contract, good security. Um, I don't know if he would, but I, I don't know if he would either. Uh, but like, th- again, that number nine mil a season jumped out at me because it's doubling his salary. Right, and the number still, I just said was seven, maybe you right. sit in the middle with eight. I don't know. But like, I feel like, you know, three for 24, four for 32, something like that, or even up to like, three for 27, four for 36. It doesn't feel, maybe you put a team option right, if it's a four right. year on, on the four, if it's a four year, the fourth year is a team option. That to me doesn't feel prohibitive for what the Lakers would want to do with Jared Vanderbilt, either as a Laker or as somebody that they would look to move, you know, to bring in somebody different. Right. But it just, with the question of whether or not it becomes trickier if he plays a lot or doesn't, the answer, to be honest, is I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. I don't. But it's, 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 that's what that's what occurred to me today when I was thinking about it because I knew we'd be talking about it. He he could be more profoundly impacted by this the Wood signing more than anybody other than Jackson Hayes, who suddenly doesn't have a path to playing time, um, and that doesn't necessarily impact the thinking for the Lakers for you know, the next three years, it, it's, it's, if they have any, might, it might not, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to. No, I, I agree. It was my point. And it's, um, where, it's interesting and ironic. Yeah. Where did the Lakers stack up in the West? Now that they've added Christian Wood to an already deep roster. That's next. I think it's fair to say Christian Wood does not take an average team and turn them into a contender. And I don't think anybody is uh, claiming that. I mean, if that were the case, he would have been to the playoffs by now. Yes. (laughs) Well, you know, then he would have taken a bad team and made them average, I suppose. And if we're trying to be fair. Um, But he has added an element to the Lakers, whether you think they should have signed somebody else, whether you preferred Bismack Biombo, undeniably. There, the the there is potential for this to work, and if it works the way the Lakers hope it does, it will have a really important impact on the roster uh, and the options that Darvin Ham has, and the different lineups they can deploy, and the matchup issues that they could present both certainly in the regular season, but also in the playoffs. Uh, it could impact where the Lakers finish in the regular season going into the playoffs because they have more depth to withstand an Anthony Davis injury, whatever it might be. Um, but now that it's sort of the dust is settled, Andy. Um, where, what do you think this does for the Lakers in the West, whether that's relative to Denver or relative to teams that are chasing Denver? I mean, look, they, they already were a team that you and I both thought are legitimate contenders. You know, I, I wouldn't go so far as to call them the front runner necessarily. And I, I mean, I don't even know how much that matters, but they were absolutely in the upper echelon of the mix. They are a team that got to the Western Conference Finals last year in a way that did not feel fluky at all. I mean, if anything, they had to beat odds to make it happen. For sure. It was impossible for them to back into the play-in. And then they took out the defending champs along the way. They took out... You know, a Memphis team that was missing some players, but they were still a good team. Um, Denver, I think, just was ultimately better than everyone. Um, Denver may, you know, I think Denver still has a better starting five than what the Lakers can put out on the court, ultimately. Um, But Denver is, you know, unless Christian Brown and like another guy on that team can really solidify themselves as reliable 20-ish minute a night if you need them players. Denver is much more top-heavy than the Lakers. Like The Lakers have better depth than Denver, even even if you think their starting five is better than the Lakers. That that depth matters. We saw it last year with, with the Nuggets when they won the championship. Bruce Brown had big games for them coming off the bench. You know, Aaron Gordon was really important for them. You know, Jeff Green had his moments. So the Lakers, if nothing else, they've made themselves really, really formidable in this chase. And I guess maybe off the top of my head, this is the way I would think about it. I don't know if the Lakers are the best team in the West, 
But I don't think there's anybody that on paper, you look at them and say, the gap between them in front of the Lakers and the Lakers is huge. Right. Or it doesn't feel like one that the Lakers can make up. And I think the other thing this does, and again, it could go wrong. It could, but particularly if you sort of play the upside on this and like, and if it pans out in the way the Lakers hope. Um, and again, does it does just because of what it really can do for the Lakers in the regular season, first and foremost, I think what it does for me is, is it takes them from a team that was definitely, you know, you would put, you know, I think they're, they're kind of in that mix of the teams right below Denver, like Denver is still at the top of the conference. And then you have that debate about who are the, the four next best teams. Is it, you know, a healthy Clippers team with the Lakers and Phoenix. I've given up on the notion of a healthy Clippers but, team. Screw that. I'm sorry. I just sorry. No. There are people, there are people who walk among us who are still thinking of, of it in those terms. S Steve you know, Ballmer doesn't is, count. Is it, you know, is it Sacramento in there? You know, we gotta remember Sacramento was the two seed last year, weren't there a three seed behind three Memphis? Seed. You know, like, is it Sacramento? Is it like, who are the next four teams? And, you know, maybe you leave the Lakers out of that. Maybe you have the Lakers near the bottom. I think now when you make that second tier of teams, the ones that are the 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 most likely contenders after the Nuggets, if you give them the, the benefit of the doubt and the credit that I think they're and due. I think you should. I agree. The Lakers are unquestionably now, not only in that group, but probably near the top of it. Like, Maybe you're a big believer in what the Suns can do. And, you know, their off season, they did. I will say this: they did more with limited resources than I thought they were going to be able to do. Yep. Um, but still, limited resources, still a potentially top-heavy roster, and and whatever. But man, that top is is pretty pretty impressive. You know, when you know DeAndre Ayton is arguably your fourth best player, and you have some decent players coming off the bench now. That's a thing. That's a real thing. Yeah. Um, I think Memphis, even during this period where they're not going to have Ja, I think Memphis is still going to be good. Marcus like Smart is going to do a lot of good for yep. them. Yes, he will. And so, you know, I, I there are some good teams in the West, but the Lakers, it's, it wasn't a, it, to me, it wasn't a, an automatic and a no brainer that, okay, yeah, the four among the four next best teams, of course the Lakers are in there. Well, no, not if you believe in what the Kings did. Not if you believe in you know Phoenix and not if you believe in Memphis and not if you I, I I would have put him in there, but somebody could have the debate. Now I think you cannot possibly leave them out. I mean, I I can't I can't really think of that many. I'm I'm trying to think of the teams that you actually I think you can make that argument for Phoenix, if nothing else, just the the top end potential of the sheer field. talent level yeah. of just Devin Booker and Durant. Right. healthy and playing together was pretty effective. Um, you know, and then, you know, now you added Beal and you've got Aiton and, you know, they, like I said, they did okay. Um, but, you know, Golden State is still a thing and Memphis is still a thing. Like, there are a lot of good right. teams around. But I can't think of anybody that you look at and you say, well, of course they are definitively better than the Lakers right no, now. Not, Again, no, absolutely not. Health, health presumed for all of these teams. Again, except for the Clippers because – no, you're not doing I just, that anymore. I, they're one that I can't buy into the hypothetical, theoretical. I need to actually yep. see it because there's simply been and no evidence. I need to evidence. see it in April, Andy. Yeah, um, and there's been no evidence of it whatsoever. But the teams that I, off the top of my head, I would put in that echelon with the Lakers would be Memphis. I will give Phoenix that respect, even as somebody who we talked about a lot heading into the playoffs. I didn't buy into Phoenix at all. No. Adding Bradley Beal does help. Um, I think Frank Vogel is going to help them a lot. I think Frank Vogel will be very excited to work with DeAndre Ayton, and that is something that clearly was not happening with Monty Williams. Um, so I'm going to give Phoenix that benefit of the doubt. I think Memphis will still be good. And I may be in the minority on this. I think the Warriors are going to get better heading into this year. Um, I think the whole Chris Paul off the bench thing is not going to become a problem. I think he's going to play off the bench. I don't think he's going to complain. And I think he's actually going to be really helpful for what for what they need. Right. The other team I'd throw in there is at least as a regular season team is Sacramento. I, I think it's a mistake sure. to kind of look past that. I think they should be better. Um, 
But I think the Thunder are also. I mean, I don't see them as a contender, but I think the Thunder no, is a wild make, card to really jump up in the way that Memphis did a couple years ago. Yeah, I think the um, Thunder are going to, if nothing else, make the Western Conference regular season really interesting. But if I'm if I'm seeding the Lakers right now, they're no worse than third, and <clears throat> that you know, and it's it's a, it's a solid third. It's like a good third. Um, so it's a third you feel good about. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I don't, I don't think this is a point that we could overstate between now and the beginning of the season just how much cooler that the, we uh, of a place we're in now as whether you're just a diehard fan whether you're uh, you know somebody who just loves the nba whether you just have to talk about the team you know day on a daily basis <laughs> or whatever whatever you're or if you're me is, all of the above all of the above it's this season has so much potential to be, you know, just not just like exciting, but also interesting and with, you know, great storylines. And look, guys are going to get hurt during the year, but the Lakers have enough depth to withstand that. And as long as the right players are healthy at the right time at the end of the year, they should be right up there with the ability to contend. And it's like, you don't have to squint and you know put yourself in pretzel knots like you were trying to have to do to come up with optimistic scenarios in September of last year. And I am super excited yeah. about what that means going into training camp and into the regular season. Yeah. I mean, you and I have been doing this a long time. We've covered teams that heading into the season were considered contenders. We've covered teams that heading into the season were considered uh Train wrecks in the making. The first is better. First is way, way, better. way, way better. better. So yeah, it's exciting. I, I I am genuinely looking forward to training camp opening on October second. I'm actually looking forward to preseason games. I want I want to see yes. what all of this looks like. Yes, so do I. Um, all right, locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go. Where do you think the Lakers stack up in the West? Um, maybe do you think they're better? I mean, I don't know. Are we are we at better than Denver State uh, now among Lakers fans? We did praise you for your um, both your enthusiasm and your rationality in Thursday's show. So maybe if you think they're better than Denver, we could we could roll that back. Um, but where where do you, as a Laker fan, think that they are in the Western Conference? i uh, love to get your reaction to that as we head into next week. Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to see the show, hang out with over 20,000 subscribers, uh, and we will see everybody next week.